Hello, this is a keynote for the workshop on autonomous driving at CVPR 2021. And even though the workshop is about autonomous driving, today I want to step back and talk about the basics. Let me begin by quoting from the Handbook of Child Psychology and Developmental Science, the chapter on motor development. The average toddler can run circles around the world's most sophisticated robots. By 18 months of age, toddlers can coordinate their limbs to navigate living room clutter, run into mother's arms, crawl under a chair, or climb up a flight of stairs. They can control their arms to pound a peg or pet a cat and configure their hands to unscrew the lid of a water bottle or grasp a tiny bite of cracker between thumb and finger. They can synchronize torso, head, and eyes to examine a toy in hand peer under the table, or gaze at a caregiver. They can coordinate tongue and jaw to eat a snack or speak their intentions. And whereas robots can still only perform particular tasks in particular environments, toddlers multitask in variable environments. They walk, talk, look around, and interact with objects and people all at the same time. How do we get there? That's what I want to talk about today. The basics, embodied intelligence, sensory motor learning. How do we do it? Let's think about the first principles. My conservative assumption that I want to advance today is that we're not going to outlearn the child. The child is the most impressive, the most effective learning system we know. If the child needs 18 months of experience, our artificial learners will need at least 18 months of experience. The child is an awesome learning system and we are not going to outlearn the child. A more conservative assumption would be that we need an order of magnitude, more than an order of magnitude experience than the child, but let's start conservatively by saying we'll need at least as much experience as the child since our learners are nowhere near as effective at learning as the child. But that's not it. That's not all. How about designing the learner? To design the learner, we need an outer loop of some sort that tries out different learning architectures and different learning settings and different hyperparameters and different learning schedules. This outer loop in reality was performed by evolution that tried out trillions of prototype learners to arrive at the learning architectures we have today. This child that achieves this incredible level of competence in 18 months is the result of trillions of experiments by evolution. Here, I am hopeful. I think we can be more efficient than that because evolution is not teleological. Evolution is not a goal-directed process. Evolution was not deliberately from the get-go aiming to arrive as quickly as possible at the most effective embodied learning system. We are. We know what we want. So we can drive there more deliberately than evolution did. However, there is no doubt that we will need an extensive outer loop that tries out different designs, different learning architectures, different learning schedules. Right now, we have no idea what the right architecture is that would give us the abilities that the child has. So we need extensive prototyping, extensive architecture search, extensive design exploration, and extensive hyperparameter tuning. That is the outer loop. How do we do this? If our inner loop is 18 months, how do we go through this process? We need to run experiments and observe the outcomes. And the only feasible solution is to accelerate the inner loop. Accelerate the inner loop 
by, simple, by simulating reality at faster than real time rates. How do we compare? How do we compress 18 months of experience into overnight? How do we compress 18 months of subjective learning and development into overnight? Overnight is a comfortable debug cycle. Overnight means that you launch an experiment at the end of the day, go home, come back in the morning, the experimental results are ready. You can tune some things during the day before you launch the next experiment. Well, compressing 18 months of subjective experience into eight hours requires an acceleration of 1620. If we simulate reality at 30 frames per second, 30 time steps per second, if our temporal granularity is 30 time steps per second, we need to get to 50,000 frames per second. 50,000 frames per second running the coupled simulation and learning system at 50,000 frames per second will allow us to compress the inner loop, the debug cycle, from 18 months to 8 hours. We can, of course, be more ambitious than that. Because 8 hours is still pretty long, it is a kind of time, a kind of debug cycle that is aimed at a human, a human that is in the loop and is taking a day, a work day, to tune parameters or do some exploration before launching another experiment with a new architecture, with a new design. But a lot of this outer loop exploration will be automatic. It will be an automatic architecture search, hyperparameter tuning process, perhaps some kind of evolutionary process that is automatically exploring different designs, different variations, and it's just launching every variant that it decides to try out and, and seeing how well it learns. For this kind of automatic outer loop, it would be much better to have, let's say, a one hour long inner loop, a one hour long debug cycle. So how do we compress 18 months of experience into one hour? We do that by simulating 18 months of experience in one hour, which requires an acceleration of roughly 13,000, four orders of magnitude. We need to accelerate reality by four orders of magnitude to get a very comfortable one hour long debug cycle. So if reality takes at 30 frames per second, we are aiming at 400,000 frames per second in our coupled simulation and learning. Our simulation and learning system needs to yield a throughput, provide a throughput of 400,000 frames per second. That is what we are aiming at. And I will show you today that this is possible. We can achieve hundreds of thousands and even a million frames per second in coupled simulation and learning in immersive three-dimensional environments. This line of work was driven by three amazing PhD students that have all spent time or are now spending time in my lab, Alexei Petremka, Eric Wymans, and Brennan Shacklett. These are amazing, superhuman PhD students. And as you can see, they've achieved superhuman results. I'll begin with Sample Factory, our paper that was presented at ICML 2020 last year at ICML. Sample Factory is a clean, first principles, clean slate system design for high throughput reinforcement learning in immersive environments. There are a number of key ideas here. First, specialization. 
every process specializes in a very particular, very narrow workload, and that's all that process does at parallel, in parallel with massive parallelism, trying to get the highest level of utilization for the hardware by specialization. There are workers that all they do is simulate agents in the immersive environments. That's all they do. They don't do learning. They don't do the thinking of the agents. They just simulate agent actions and get environment responses. There are other processes that simulate the neural network in the agent's brain. They do the forward passes through the neural network. So that's all they do, just forward passes. All the time, full throttle forward passes with whatever weights and whatever observations are given to them by other workers. And there is a third type of worker, and what it does is the backward passes. That's the learner. It gets experiences, already collected experiences by other processes, and it does the back propagation, the backward passes. The second key idea is that all the processes communicate through shared memory buffers. There is no message passing because every message passing protocol is too slow. Once you ramp up to hundreds of thousands of frames per second, message passing becomes the bottleneck. So we don't do message passing. Everybody just writes and reads from shared memory buffers. And here there is a cute idea that we borrowed from computer graphics, which is double buffering. When two types of agents need to essentially access read and write from the same buffer, the buffer is split into two. Agent A, agent type A, process type A, reads from buffer A. Process type B writes to buffer B, writes fresh information, for example, fresh neural network weights. And at certain points in time, they just swap pointers. They just swap pointers. When new information is ready in buffer B, buffer B becomes buffer A. That's now the buffer from which process, processes A read the latest neural network weights and the processes B start writing neural networks uh, weights to the other buffer that used to be buffer A, but uh, is now the buffer that is, that is pointed to by, uh, by processes B. It's a super simple idea, and it basically makes sure that nobody ever waits for anybody. There is never a reason to wait. There is no situation in which agents need to wait for new neural network weights, or the learning process needs to wait for new observations. There are always some reasonably up-to-date neural network weights in the buffer that the process points to, always some reasonably recent observations in the buffer that uh, the uh, neural network points to everybody always has data to work with. Nobody ever needs to wait for anything. With this clean slate design, we achieve more than 100,000 frames per second in an immersive environment such as Doom with a single GPU on a single node. One GPU, one machine one workstation class machine. This is incredible. With the game Doom in particular, I like the game Doom and we've used it in the past. I like it in part because I played it as a teenager and in part because it is a classic game that popularized a whole genre, the genre of first person shooters and gave birth to a multi-billion dollar industry. It is also open source. It is open source and easy to work with. We've worked with it before. The green horizontal line here, DFP, stands for Direct Future Prediction. 
which is an approach that we presented in an iClear paper several years ago. At the time, we won an international competition of AI agents playing Doom, and we achieved a certain level of performance in playing Doom from just raw pixel observations, and that's 30-something uh, points here, the green horizontal line. The paper, by the way, is called Learning to Act by Predicting the Future. It's now a few years old, but I still like it very much. I think we said some things there that are quite good and are still worth reading. At any rate, a couple of years after that, we published another paper in which we showed that intermediate representations produced by computer vision provide a higher level of performance. They provide a boost of sorts by a few points. And that here is the orange horizontal line. The orange horizontal line is actually another very nice paper that was published at Science Robotics and uh, talked about the utility of computer vision. Well, you can see the punchline. With sample factory, with just brute force, we can blow past those levels of performance by just an absolutely massive factor. And that is because sample factory allows us to learn so fast that we can run billions and billions of time step and just brute force through this learning process. When we pit our agents that are trained with sample factory against the in-game bots in Doom, there is just no competition. Our agents crush the in-game bots. Here, the bots, the non-player characters, are set to the highest possible level of difficulty. This is very difficult. As a human, if you try to play against the uh, in-game bots at the very highest level of difficulty, for mere mortals like me, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. For professional players, it's easier, uh, but, uh, but the in-game bots at the highest level of difficulty are, are, are really quite, uh, quite uh, scary. Well, our agents very quickly, well, quickly, within billions of time steps, which are made possible by Sample Factory, but very quickly in wall clock time, blow past that level of performance and just crush the in-game bots. There is just no competition anymore. DeepMind has a benchmark suite uh, based on their DeepMind Lab platform. This is a suite of about 30 immersive environments, tasks in immersive environments, using Sample Factory on a single machine with a single 4GPU node, a workstation class, 4GPU node. We achieved a higher level of performance than a DeepMind team that used a massive distributed cluster. Sample Factory allowed us to train so fast and get to 10 billion time steps of experience so fast on a single machine that we outperformed what DeepMind did with their Impala project on a, sing on a massive distributed system. The second work I want to present is an iClear paper that was just presented this year, iClear 2021, a few weeks ago. Large batch simulation for deep reinforcement learning. And here we worked with more realistic environments. These are 3D scanned environments from the Matterport data set. They have some issues. I wouldn't quite call them photorealistic, as you can see that there are some artifacts, but they're certainly much closer to reality than Doom or DeepMind Lab. These are real, scanned, real-world environments. And the task here is navigation. You're given a coordinate in the environment, and the agent needs to get there as quickly as possible through potentially a very complex environment where the agent needs to traverse through rooms and corridors, maybe backtrack if needed, and get to a particular point in this extensive, complex, interconnected environment with a lot of occlusion. 
This batch processing simulator, BPS, batch processing simulator, is again a clean first principles system design for maximizing the throughput of this kind of coupled simulation and sensory motor learning in these immersive, reasonably high fidelity real world environments. The key idea is batch simulation and rendering where a large number of agents are simulated all at the same time. Their simulation is done in parallel by the same process and they are rendered their observations in their different environments that they're instantiated in is rendered with a single rendering call. This is what it looks like. We in effect render an absolutely enormous image in GPU memory. This is one buffer in GPU memory and with a single render call into this image we render a huge number of tiles, hundreds of tiles. Each tile corresponds to the first person observation of one of the agents. Agents are deployed in instances of the same small number of environments and the 3D assets, the geometry and textures from these environments are shared by these different agents. To get good sensory motor learning, we don't have every single agent to be in a completely different environment. Multiple agents can be instantiated in parallel in different copies, different instantiations of the same environment, just with somewhat different tasks in somewhat different places and somewhat different configurations. These instantiations reuse the same assets that are in GPU memory. And by rendering everything with a single render call into a single memory buffer, we drive the hardware, the rendering hardware at peak utilization, at peak performance. These ideas allow us to render and simulate and learn with these complex high fidelity scanned real world environments at on the order of 70,000 frames per second. We achieve 70,000 frames per second for coupled simulation, rendering, and learning. The whole thing, simulation, rendering, and learning in the loop on an 8 GPU node with at 72,000 frames per second. This allows us to train navigation agents that roughly match the prior state of the art on this navigation benchmark. We train navigation agents that attain the same level as the state of the art in one and a half days, in walk lock time, one and a half days, on a single GPU. And we attain the level of performance on a single GPU in one and a half days that was set just a year earlier on a massive industrial scale 64 GPU cluster in three days of walk lock time. So we collapse three days of training on a massive industrial scale 64 GPU cluster into one and a half days on a single GPU, a workstation. This brings to mind a cheeky quote that was attributed by Paul Barnham. You can have a second computer. Once you've shown, you know how to use the first one. The third paper I want to present today is Megaverse. And this is the first time this work is presented in public. Megaverse is a paper that was just accepted to ICML, ICML 2021. It will be presented next month at the ICML conference. And I'm telling you about this today for the first time. It has never been presented before. Megaverse is again a clean slate first principles system design that aims to attain 1 million frames per second on a single 8 GPU node in interactive environments that are shaded and lit in real time. So you have lighting, you have shading, and they're dynamic, they're interactive, that allow us to prototype 
object manipulation, rearrangement. The agents can really engage with these environments and modify them, manipulate them, and interact with them. And we achieve it. We achieve our goal. We hit and exceed a million frames per second on a single AGPU node. An AGPU node is a standard hardware consider, uh, configuration that is present in many deep learning labs. Generally, a standard configuration is an AGPU node. And on one of these, we attain a million frames per second for coupled simulation and learning with these interactive environments. There are a number of ideas here. The key idea really is this batch simulation and learning we build directly on the work that I presented to you earlier. And we just leverage and maximize this batch simulation and rendering such that a single process, a single instance of Megaverse can in parallel advance hundreds of environments, each containing multiple agents and render them in parallel into a single GPU buffer with this kind of tiling that I showed you earlier. We leverage key ideas that I described earlier, specialization, batch simulation, and rendering to attain a million frames per second in real-time dynamic shaded environments. Before I proceed and show you some of these environments, let us step back and consider again what a million frames per second means. A million frames per second is a century of, of experience in one day that allows us to simulate a century of subjective learning experience in one day and whole clock time, or four years of subjective experience in one hour. Here's one environment. This is the obstacles environment in our Megaverse 8 benchmark suite that we built using the Megaverse platform. The goal here is to get to a green patch of the environment by modifying the environment as needed to traverse it. Here is a high wall, and to traverse it, the agent needs to build a staircase. And you can see the agent building a staircase. And now the agent is going to build a bridge over the red patch. The red patch is lava. Bad. If you step into it, you die. So the agent builds a bridge and then traverses this bridge many times to build another staircase to traverse another wall and get to the goal. This is actually quite hard. For a human, we can get the hang of it. We can do it, but it's, it's hard. It's hard. The environments are procedurally generated. You never see the same environment twice. The agent never sees the same environment twice. This is very important for avoiding overfitting and understanding that we're really training agents that are learning generalizable skills for testing generalization. We can just generate environments again and again and again and again, and we're going to get a different environment at a calibrated level of difficulty every single time. And we can change the level of difficulty. We have easier obstacle environments. We have harder obstacle environments. This obstacle environment is only one kind of environment, one out of very many kinds of tasks and environments that you can build with the Megaverse platform. And the platform provides multi-agent support out of the box. Just natively, you can simulate multiple agents, dozens of agents in the same environment. They can be organized into teams. Some can collaborate, some can compete, depending on the task and really your level of imagination for what you want to try out, what kind of embodied intelligence dynamics you uh, want to stress. We think of Megaverse and the Megaverse environments as a platform for building model systems for embodied AI. It's a platform for model systems for embodied AI. And the analogy here is neuroscience. In neuroscience, much of what we know about learning and memory comes from experiments on model systems such as aplesia, a sea slug, 
at the top image, you see a plesia, the sea slug, in its native habitat at the bottom of the sea floor. In the left image, you see Eric Kandel, Nobel laureate, holding an aplesia in his hands. He has worked with aplesia for decades and using experiments on aplesia, he established what we know, much of what we know about how learning and memory work in animals, including humans. But rather than running experiments on humans in the whole complexity of our natural environment and the complexity of our nervous system and the difficulty of doing experiments on, on humans, instead, he made the strategic call of citing a simpler model system, aplesia. Aplesia has a simpler nervous system and it has beautiful large neurons that you can see with the naked eye. But the basics, the foundations, the basic principles of learning and memory are actually the same. The principles that drive the organization of the learning system and the formation of memory are the same. So by working with the model system, Aplesia, he was able to learn much of what we now know about how learning and memory works in animals, including humans. When he gave his Nobel Prize lecture in the year 2000, he showed the picture of Aplesia with the Nobel Prize, the picture that you see on the right is taken from Eric Kandel's Nobel Prize lecture to acknowledge the role that Aplesia played in this work. Our argument is that fairly simple immersive environments of the kind that you can build and simulate at a million frames per second in megaverse can lead to this kind of fundamental understanding of the basic principles of sensory motor learning and embodied intelligence. As long as these environments elicit the kind of advanced embodied con cognition that we are interested in, navigation, exploration, long-term planning, long-term memory, the formation of internal representations, as long as we can elicit these with our model environments, we can usefully, productively, informatively study embodied cognition, embodied intelligence, sensory motor learning in these model environments built and simulated on top of megaverse which sure is convenient because we can do it at a million frames per second with a very, very manageable debug cycle. To give you just some indication that we're onto something here, that we can uh, simulate pretty non-trivial challenges in megaverse with a million frames per second, this is the uh, learning curve, the learning success rate, over 2 billion time steps for model free reinforcement learning in these obstacle environments that I showed you. Remember that every environment is different every single time. They're all procedurally generated, so the environments are not identical to what I showed you, but they come from the same procedural uh, generation mechanism. And you see a beautiful flat curve that stays at zero. Turns out model free reinforcement learning, at least our fairly credible instantiation of it by fairly experienced researchers, just doesn't get off the ground. So model free reinforcement learning, with a fairly reasonable instantiation of it, just doesn't get off the ground with tasks of this complexity which provides some indication that there's something interesting here. There's certainly something worth looking at and understanding. And my hypothesis is that this can lead to deeper fundamental understanding of the basic principles of embodied AI. 
Here's another task. This is tower building. The goal here is to build a tower that is as high as possible on the black perimeter, within the black perimeter on the black patch. This is human performance. This is a human performing this task. You can see that the environment is dynamic, interactive. We're moving building, building materials around. We have a suite of eight different tasks. Now you're seeing the second out of eight. This is our bench, Megaverse 8 benchmark suite that test aspects of embodied cognition that seem to us to be fundamental navigation, exploration, tool use, manipulation, long-term planning, and memory. Here you will see the procedural generation aspect. You'll see a number of these environments, a number of tower building environments generated procedurally. Again, never see the same environment twice. You get to test generalization very well in this way. One very interesting aspect of these environments, the tower building environments, is that model free RL does attain a good level of performance. Here you will see a trained agent, trained with model free RL in Megaverse, building a tower. This is no longer human gameplay, this is an agent. And you will see that the agent got the hang of it. They understand what building a tower means. They need to build it progressively, maintaining a staircase structure that lets them go up and down and up and down and carry building material to the top to make the tower, the tower even higher. And they also understand how to wrap it around within the black patch to stay within the area that they must operate in. Very, very neat. Here is a third environment. This is called Rearrange. This is inspired by the classic MAT copy demo. You're given a configuration of objects on the white platform, and you need to reproduce it with building materials that you're given on the blue platform. So whatever you see over there, you now need to create it over here on the blue platform. You're watching human gameplay. This is Alexei doing this task, and Alexei can, of course, do it. But turns out Model Free RL not so much. Model free RL does not get off the ground and in our experiment so far does not attain a good level of performance on this rearrangement task. Here you'll see the procedural generation aspect, the procedural generation of multiple of these rearrangement environments. And now I showed you three, three out of the eight megaverse environments in the megaverse eight benchmark suite. We think the benchmark suite is good, but what I'm even more excited about is Megaverse as a platform that allows you to create such benchmarks. Megaverse is a platform that allows you to create such classes of procedurally generated worlds that stress different aspects of embodied cognition, and you can try out training agents in these worlds with your favorite learning paradigm, your favorite approach to sensory motor learning, and benefit from a million frames per second. So simple complexity is no longer a good excuse. We take away simple complexity as an excuse for poor performance. You can easily get billions of time steps during learning, tens of billions of time steps. No problem. If you want to try out something that requires tens of billions of time steps, no problem. The remaining problem is the fundamental understanding of sensory motor agent architectures, internal representations that they construct, and learning processes that they go through. To summarize, speed matters. Achieving hundreds of thousands or millions of frames per second reduces our debug cycle such that we can study advanced embodied intelligence with very, very comfortable, very short inner loops that allow us to then iterate 
rapidly over different learning designs, learning architectures, and hyperparameter configurations. And the good news is that we can. We can attain hundreds of thousands and now a million frames per second with clean slate, first principles, system design. And we can do it with hardware that is present in pretty much every deep learning lab, a single eight GPU machine. You don't need custom, massive, distributed infrastructure that is only found in industrial research lab, labs. You can do it. You can do this kind of research and probe the foundations of embodied cognition and embodied AI in your lab with a single eight GPU node. There are a number of design patterns that are proving very useful in this sequence of projects, extensive use of shared memory rather than message passing, double buffering, and notably batch simulation and rendering. The frontier here, I think, is maximizing throughput with photorealistic simulation of very high fidelity, dynamic, real world environments. The megaverse environments I showed you are like model systems. And I made an argument that these model systems can carry us a long way. And, way, and I believe this argument. I think this argument is good and it is true that model systems of this sort can give us fundamental understanding and carry us a long way. However, in the meantime, we should also explore how far we can push high fidelity simulation of very complex real world environments that capture as much of the real world as we can, because at some point we will need it. At some point it will come in handy when we're, our fundamental understanding is further along higher fidelity simulation of more complex environments that are closer and closer to the real world will become more and more important. We are working on this now, and I encourage all of you to work on this as well. It is an absolutely fascinating problem. Thank you very much.